All right, all right. Hello, everybody. I am bumming it tonight. I'm exhausted. The course finally wrapped up last night and I closed my doors so that I could get started with everybody today once and for all, which is super exciting. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Raven Woods and I'm the CEO and founder of Autism Mama Rocks, the IEP, and I help parents gain the knowledge and confidence to become the CEO of their IEP meeting. So for those of you who really know me, you guys know that I'm pretty hardcore. Um, I, I'm definitely a go-getter and I get things done. So um, that's more my personality if that, that just gives you a little taste of it. But I like to get things done. I like to get parents the things that they need for their children and what's needed and appropriate for that child and their impact of disability. And I have been through this whole process and dealt with it for the past 12 and a half years, hitting on 13. And um, it, it's been quite the journey, okay? So I, I've been in the trenches. I've been there with all of you. I, I've been through hell and back and um, dealt with this whole process for such a long time, not only for myself and my daughter, but for hundreds of other parents as well. And let me tell you, I totally get it, totally get it. So for those of you who are new, post a one below, say hello. This is the page, obviously a lot of more personal and interpersonal relationships and things that are a little bit more connected happen over on the group, so definitely join us there. But if you're new to this page, welcome. And please post a one below if you are new, post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie, you guys know the drill. All right, so with that said, it's a Monday night. It's actually, you know, sometimes it's a busy night, sometimes it's a not so busy night. So those of you who are catching the replay, Post a one below if you're new. Just say hello. I'll, I'll catch up with you later and I'll definitely say hello back. And again, if you're an oldie but goodie, post a two below and say hey. So I know you guys hopped on and said, you know, hey to me just to say hey. Or you guys usually will PM me as well. But just so you guys know, hello, hello. I want you guys to feel welcome. Post a one below if you're new, two below if you're an oldie but goodie. Everybody is welcome. And I am so excited that so many of you guys show up, even for the replays. I've been told many, many, many times of people I had no idea who they were until they said, yeah, I, I've watched your videos over and over and over and I had an IEP and I marathon watched them. And it's just the cutest thing. So I think that's awesome. I'm glad you guys find value in that. So today I actually... Um, I'm going to cover a subject that I've dealt with a couple times um, with parents, and it's something that seems to be happening more and more often, which is we're going to talk about restraints and seclusion. And it's not something that any of us, I guess the word would be condone, but at the same time, because you guys know and those of you who know me, I'm a devil's advocate. I look at both sides. Bottom line, I'm always on the side of what's needed and appropriate for that child. Okay? So I'm not talking about this to get into any type of political conversation with anybody. Okay? I don't talk about politics on this page. That's actually one of the rules. You cannot talk politics and um, or immunizations. So this is another one of those tough things. However, it has to do with the IEP, so I'm just going to give it to you and you can take it or leave it. However, it is fact. It comes from the Department of Education and it is in place as far as laws, okay? So with that said, the number one thing you need to know in regards to restraint and seclusion is you, the parent, have pretty much all the rights here. Okay, so I have it in front of me right here so that I can be completely accurate. I always write my notes down. You guys know that. Um, but the number one thing, too, is uh, a lot of complaints are actually uh, made in regards to seclusion. Real quick, I'm going to touch on this. In regards to seclusion restraints, and those, res those complaints typically would go to OCR. All right. So for those of you who don't know what OCR is, it is the Office of Civil Rights. OK, so that's where you would complain in regards to discrimination. All right. And that's not a color thing. 
And, you know, as far as that's concerned, I mean, everybody always thinks color it has nothing to do with color usually when it comes to special education, okay? It has to do with a discrimination in regards to that child in any way, shape, or form. I don't care what it is, all right? So let's not really get kind of petty with that. Let's just look at it straight up as discrimination, as discrimination, as discrimination about anybody, anything, period. And in regards to children, and in regards to restraints and seclusion, um, most complaints will go to the office of OCR. And the reason for that is it's very hard to make a state complaint in regards to it without the solid proof, all right? So if you have the solid proof, I had a parent send me a video the other day that was extremely disturbing. Um, I did not really know how to digest it, to be quite honest. Um, the child was uh, seven, eight years old, I want to say, and was being handcuffed by the cops, um, thrown into the back of uh, a police car, um, yanked out of his house um, because he, he, I guess, had run home, is what she had said, from school. And um, then it, this has happened. Another video was in the parking lot of the school, the police officer restrain this child. We're talking a seven, eight year old. I want to say no more than eight um, and putting them in the back of a police car. So when we see things like that, all right, and being a devil's advocate, you know, because this is this is what I do for a living. I love it. And I advocate for parents and children and the IEP process. And so I have to really look at things on both ends. I can't, you know, as many of you know, when you guys ask me something, I'll ask you guys questions back because I have to understand the whole picture. So anybody that delivers you information that you just want to hear is not giving you always accurate information. And so when I deliver information, it's not always what you want to hear, but it's factual. Okay. Um, oh, and I hope you guys watched those interviews that I had yes yesterday. Five parents, three on one, two on the other. They were so great. I loved it. It was so fun. Um, but anyway, getting back to restraints and seclusion for Monday's tip of the week, um, which is kind of a hard subject to discuss, to be quite honest. It's disturbing to me and not many things disturb me. Um, so with that said, hey guys, how are you? So with that said, number one, complaints typically will go to OCR. That's number one, okay? And you guys know I never do just one tip of the week, okay? So here we go. Um, the state, it's really hard unless you have some serious solid proof of something that was done out of malice to your child, all right? What a lot of parents don't realize is that the school systems can honestly legally restrain your child to protect either your child or the staff, but... If a parent writes an email to say, I don't want my child restrained, or this is the only way in which you can restrain my child, et cetera, hi, how are you? Then the school actually has to adhere to that. Now, if that doesn't work, then what happens is the school system will then have to call you, all right? And dependent on if the school system wants to be an ass or not, then they will, one, call you, and if you can't make it there within an hour, they'll call CPS on you. Or two, they'll they'll deal with it, okay? So you do have the right to say, okay, this is all you can do to restrain my child. And in all honesty, if you want my opinion, okay, take it or leave it. If your child's in danger and you're, a lot of children with autism and other disabilities can get out of hand, all right? They can have meltdowns where they're harming themselves, they're harming other children, throwing desks, hitting themselves, pinching themselves, doing that to other children, etc. I think as just normal human beings, we realize that that's not okay. So with that said, and with the understanding that our children have special needs and they typically cannot help it at all, we have to think in our heads without emotion, okay? What is it that's going to keep my child safe when that happens, all right? And a lot of the issue is many of us 
parents don't trust the school system with our children when that's happening because we're like, what do you mean you're restraining my kid? You know, but yet if they were at home, we would hold that, you know, at least I've held Skylar, you know, in my lap and just held her tight or wrapped a weighted blanket around her literally a couple times and held her because she can, you know, she she's hit her head before, you know, she's gotten out of that, but she went through a phase where she was hitting her head. She was hurting herself. And she never hurt others, but she was herself. And so something has to go in place and has to be put into the IEP in regards to this if your child either harms themselves or can harm others in a way that they act in regards to a meltdown or anything that's going on with them, whatever's setting them off, etc. Okay? Because you have to think of not just your child, but other children as well. Okay? And then you need to think about if the school has to restrain my child, because I know, just hypothetically, that my child can hit themselves or my child can throw themselves on the floor and bang their head or my child can do this, that, and the other, okay? Or my child can get aggressive and throw a desk or throw things. Then right away, you need to know that something has to go in that IEP so it's clarified it's specific and there's no ands, ifs, or buts about it because the problem with this is, is so many people keep this stuff either from the school or something in the, in the way that it's not put into the IEP and then the school can restrain your child without an email from you or something in writing from you that says no or this is what you can do or whatever if it's put in the IEP, which is better. Um then they can restrain their, your child. So remember that and keep that in mind. You have a choice here, okay? So if you don't trust certain things that the school does, then you need to make sure that you put whatever it is you do want to keep your child and other children safe in that IEP. I don't care what you have to do. I don't care if you have to record them at home. I don't care what you have to do, but you have to record how they are acting, let the school system know that, hey, this can happen. You have to be honest about that because if they go and restrain your child and you go get all pissed off about it because you thought that you actually had a say because you didn't say anything at all, didn't show them a video, didn't tell them that your child can be aggressive, okay, and then your child has a complete meltdown, which is normal, but has a complete meltdown, either harms themselves or harms somebody else or throws desks or whatever, and then you're pissed off because the school restrained them. Not okay, all right? But it, then again, it's not okay for the school system to take it upon themselves and do some of the things that they do. Now, we are not by any means talking about the crazy shit we see on the internet by the locking a kid in a closet. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? So what I'm talking about here is general restraints, which typically... A paraeducator and a teacher, especially a special education teacher, should be trained in specific strategies in regards to restraint, all right? There's several different ones out there, and I can post them for you if you'd like for me to write them down for you, but there's specific trainings that people within the school system have to be trained on by law. Okay, so they have to have so many hours of this training on a yearly basis. Some of them are yearly, some of them are every two years, where they're trained how to properly restrain a child so that that child doesn't get hurt, so that they don't get hurt, and that marks aren't left. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to run by you as well is you do... When you write an email or a letter and you say, hey, I don't want my child restrained or I don't want my child restrained like this, A, B, and C, then you need to specify what you do approve of, all right? You need to specify what it is you will allow. And then at your next IEP meeting or call one right away, which if your child's restrained, you should actually always go into an IEP meeting and discuss it immediately. It shouldn't be something where you go so many months after a restraint um, to 
to to discuss this. It needs to be in writing in your IEP that any time your child is restrained, not only do you get something in writing home, not in the backpack, emailed to you, all right? In regards to, you know, hey, Miss Smith, I just wanted to let you know that your child, you know, was restrained today. This is what happened. This is what we did. This is what happened afterward, etc. cetera. And then they need to provide the form in which all schools have in regards to restraint. So an email that says, hey, this is what's up, then the form, along with the fact that you need to get a phone call. Okay, so there has to be a process here. All right. I don't recommend saying if your child's aggressive in any way or if your child can harm themselves or other children or throw things, etc. I don't suggest saying no to a restraint because the restraint is not always how you visualize it. Okay. So a restraint can actually be being in a room with a paraeducator, teacher, etc to just calm down and they're in, you know, like just a regular room by themselves with this person. So they're not like put in there and lock the door, you know, to calm them down and to relax them and get them back on track because they've had a complete meltdown and things need to just relax for a second. That's actually a type of restraint. It's just not a physical restraint. Okay. So there's different types of restraints. There's different things that can happen. The one thing I would definitely make sure of is that anybody that restrains in a school system has been trained in some sort of restraint strategy, okay? So many children that have BIPs, okay, um, especially specifically for behavior, any, anybody that put that together in regards to behavior, and hopefully it was a BCBA, uh, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, um, they, they are trained all the time, um, in regards to restraints. All right. And there's specific restraint strategies that they use. A lot of different companies use different ones, but, um, it's important, very important because if you're restraining a child that, and you don't have that training, then somebody can get hurt. All right. So number one. Complaints typically go to OCR. You can also make a state complaint, but typically OCR because it's a discrimination in regards to that child, okay? Um, And that's if something happens that is just completely inappropriate, okay? Um, The next thing is, um, and this is federal law as well, okay? So school districts, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is like, Children with behavior challenges, okay? Let's just take that for an example. Um, And there's an emergency situation, all right? Uh, Seclusion as well um, can be, let me say this in the right way because I don't want you to take it and dissect it. Okay, so restraints and seclusion for children in the school system, all right, with disabilities, if they're restrained and secluded, it actually could fall under failure to provide a free and appropriate public education. Don't go running with this, guys. Not yet. Okay? Just hear me out here. All right? So, like I said in the beginning, being a devil's advocate, when you have a child that has behavior issues, which many of us do, you need to have in place a form of restraint. You just do. Okay, there's no not doing anything. Even as parents, we do something. So the school system cannot have their school teachers and providers being hurt or other children being hurt. It's their job to keep them safe and it's their job to keep our child safe. Okay, so if you know that your child has behavior issues and something could go down, then you need to have whatever it is that you're allowing the school system to do I don't care if it's taking them to a room where there's nobody else and it's just them and the paraeducator or teacher, et cetera. I don't care what it is, okay? Whatever this restraint is, sometimes your child actually has to be physically restrained. So whatever it is that you allow and and really think this through, 
do some homework on it and really put in writing on that in that IEP what it is you approve of. So it's in writing on a legal document and there's no argument. Now, they can always fail to implement the IEP. We all know that. But I'm just saying, put it into the IEP, okay? And then put the procedure and the and the process you want it to go through. How do you want this to look? Okay, your child gets restrained. Your child has a meltdown, behavior issue. Your child gets restrained in the ways that you put into the IEP. Then what do you want to happen? So as a parent, I would want a phone call, number one. Okay, this is what just went down. This is what happened. Number two, I would want it in writing. I would want everything that happened and transpired from beginning to end in writing, along with the form that they're supposed to provide you when your child is restrained, all right? Um, and then I would want to know who restrained my child and what their qualifications are and what training they had in regards to restraints and restraining a child because there should 100% be training. There's training that BCBAs have, RBTs have, BCABAs have in regards to behavior and restraints of a child. The school system has to have the same. If not, they, sh they cannot restrain your child. They don't know how. They just can't. It's illegal. They have to have training. And you have to look up in your state how many hours. Okay, so it says an idea that they have to have training, but it says in per your straight how many hours. Okay, so you have to look that up and just be open minded in reference to what you're going to put into that IEP. Be open to understanding that they have to keep their staff and other children safe and they have to keep your child safe. Okay, so as long as the restraint is in a way in which your child is not being hurt, it may be keeping them still but it's not done in a way that they're going to be hurt or it's gonna hurt somebody else. You have to figure out as a parent what you are okay with, okay? And you have to be open to what that is and not get so emotional about the situation. You have to look at it as a factual thing that happens and what is it that if it wasn't your child, you would want to happen? You have to look at things in that perspective sometimes because you're going to be fighting a brick wall if you fight that because the school system would just say, okay, well, you know, you, you can homeschool and we'll, we'll provide him a free and appropriate education and we'll provide him speech and so on and so forth, but he can't come back to the school. All right. So, and yes, there's laws in regards to if a child's, um, suspended for more than 10 days and they cannot be suspended for more than 45 unless something really goes wrong. And this is one of those things that can really go wrong. Okay. All right. So let's now move into seclusion. All right. So seclusion is also, okay. So a parent recently showed me where their child was put at a desk in the general education classroom and the desk was put against a wall, separate from all the other children. And <laughs> this was great. Um, a blue piece of tape um, went in front of the desk, out, and then came back. And that was the child's space. He couldn't leave that space at all. And his desk was secluded from the other children in that classroom. And the parent had pictures of this. That is a big deal. All right. So if your child, to, for your child to, to be provided a free and appropriate public education, they have to be able to be mainstreamed and able to go into the general educational setting. As we've discussed in the past, us as parents can decide, hey, does my child learn better in a more restrictive environment with core subjects? And then they can be mainstreamed in some of the other subjects like PE and art and music and lunch and all that. Or can my child really do well in a general education setting? 
And if my child can do well in a general education setting, is their behavior or is their disability going to impact them educationally, but at the same time with a one-on-one -on -one or some sort of accommodation and modification, will that then be able to assist them enough to be able to stay in the general education setting? Well, if that's in fact true, then yeah, put my child in the general education setting. But that does not mean that because my child has ABC said behaviors, that you get to put my child at a desk separate from the regular um, children and the children with non-disabilities and then consider them still in the general education setting and mainstreamed. No, that, that's not what happened. What happened was you put my child in the general education setting because you, I guess, had no choice and that was what was in the IEP or whatever. And so you decided as the teacher to seclude them from all the other students because they bothered you in some way, shape, or form or disrupted you and disrupted the kids, et cetera, et cetera. Now, being a devil's advocate, I'm going to go both ways here. So as parents, well, as school systems, <laughs> it's their job to provide your child what's needed and appropriate. But we all know that that doesn't happen, that they don't always do that. Very rarely do they just say, hey, Miss Smith, I just wanted to call you today and let you know that we have to give Johnny a, I don't know why I come up with all these old names, weird. Anyway, we want to give Johnny a one-on-one -on -one so that he can be in the general education setting and it will help him with his ADHD and for him to write better. And so he focuses on his work and whenever he gets distracted and his behavior is affecting him, he'll have a one-on-one -on -one and he'll have a better day. And we just wanted to call and let you know that we were going to offer that to your son because we know it's so needed for him. Don't ever expect that phone call. <laughs> it's not going to happen. All right? Not going to happen. So as much as I want to say it's the school's job to do this, 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 and this, we got to take that away because you and I both know that's not going to happen. So we have to hold them accountable. And so it's our job as the parents to then figure out what's going on. You actually have to go into the school. You actually have to observe your child. You actually have to maybe take off work or whatever it is you need to do, you have to go observe your child and you have to understand the whole picture, their side, your side, your child's side, and understand what it is that you're fighting for. If you do what I call the hunt and gather, which includes observing your child, that's just one part of it, then you know the process of what you need to do so that you know what's going on so that you can then make a educated decision versus have little bits and pieces of the picture flip out and then expect something to be done, then flip out again because nothing's being done because you don't have the story to back up to even go fight for. Make sense? So you have to know the picture. You have to know the whole story. That's why when I talk to you guys, I listen and then I offer information or sometimes I'll listen to a piece, give my advice, listen to some more, give some advice or whatever, but I have to understand the picture. If I don't understand the picture, how am I going to help you? You guys would probably think I'm nuts if I just offered advice and had no idea about your child. That would be just completely stupid. All right. So you all, as the parents who know your child better than anybody in this whole wide world, um, need to take initiative and get into the schools. Find out what's going on. By law, you're allowed to go and observe your child. If you have to make an appointment, so what? Make four or five different times and go. Figure out what's going on. Um, so yes, seclusion and restraint can be the school disregarding FAPE in regards to your child, all right? And the reason for that is a school's use of restraint and seclusion in regards to um, your child. Hi, how are you? Your son's never allowed in his own IEP. I don't even understand what that means. All right. Um, trying to look here on my notes. 
There's something else I wanted to say. Okay, yeah, yeah, I remember. All right, so a school's use of restraints or seclusion may have um, what could be called a traumatic, um, hang on, my notes just went away. I always write notes because it keeps me like on topic because you guys know I can talk. All right, so um, yeah, so the school's use of restraints or seclusion may have a traumatic impact on a child um, such that even if he or she were never again restrained or secluded might um, have academic or behavioral um, repercussions in regards to having been restrained. And the, um, the, uh, the impact on that child from being secluded or restrained um, can have devastating impact on a child. All right. So just think about it. Um, I don't know if you ever, you guys ever read the book It, but it's a disgusting book that is very interesting. And that guy is now a speaker. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, the abuse that he sustained and being secluded and locked in closets and all these different types of things, how it impacted him and how it messes with your psyche. And so um, that being said, you know, that doesn't mean you don't go into the IEP and put what it is you want um, in the IEP in regards to how you approve of your child being restrained. Or um, I, I would never approve of my child being secluded. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't even make sense to me. Um, so I know in my state it depends on their age. Um, I don't know what you're speaking of in regards to that, Christina. <laughs> Um, so just make sure that, um, you get into the schools, you find out what's going on, especially if you're getting a lot of things in regards to behavior and, um, you definitely want to nip in the bud, any type of seclusion. Um, but you also want to be open to what it is you are willing to agree with in regards to a restraint, if at all, and ever needed. Um, and if you're not, you're not, but then expect that phone call to come pick up your child. So it's kind of like what you want to do. So if you want to go pick up your child every time this happens and you have to go get them and typically you have to be there within an hour, then do that. If not, then choose to allow your child to be restrained in whatever way that you approve. Okay. And you all know what that is. Okay, How, whatever it is, maybe that you do at home or, you know, if it's remove that child from the environment in which they're in so that people are safe and they're taken into a room with a teacher or provider to calm them down, you know, um, if you don't want a teacher touching them. But at the same time, if your child can't be removed because they're losing it and they're kicking and screaming and throwing things and this, that and the other, then something has to happen. The school has to do something. So you have to think really hard as a parent as to what it is you approve of and what it is you don't approve of. Because bottom line, the school system has a right to protect themselves, to protect those other children, but also protect your child. And if your child is losing it and throwing desks and harming themselves or harming others, then something has to be done. Okay, so you, if your child is like that, I highly recommend you immediately get into an IEP. You immediately put whatever it is that you approve of as a restraint into the IEP so that is agreed by all and understood. All right. And it can be a discussion because that's actually something you do want to discuss, that you're not fighting a wall here, that there's actually preliminary things that you have to set in place so that you all are in agreement. OK, with with regards to restraining a child. All right. In regards to um, seclusion, that's a no, no. All right. That that ha honestly um, can have actually a bigger impact traumatically on a child and their academic career. You know, um, it could really mess with their psyche enough to where they don't even want to go to school 
or it, it could really mess with them enough to where they're they're fearful to go to school or fearful of somebody. Um, so sometimes it's the non-physical things that can be the most devastating. So understand that it can be thrown in under restraints as well, because there's some restraining that goes on that is just insane and um, should never, ever be allowed to be able to, you know, um, restrain a child, which is, I'm sure, for that child and for the person doing it, um, is traumatic. And so the crucial thing that I would, I would have you become mindful of would be to make sure 100% that whoever is restraining your child, even if it's just putting their hands together like this and, you know, it has to be in a way that's gentle, but then on the other hand, it's, if they're freaking out and screaming and yelling and all these things are going on, it's a really difficult, difficult thing. So make sure if, if you do anything, number one, put it in their IEP, what it is you approve of and make sure you know your child completely well in regards to their behavior so that you know factually, okay, this is what's going to be able to calm him down. And this is what you need to do physically so that he's not hurting himself or others. All right. Number two, whoever is restraining your child needs to have had training. There is hours of training that goes into providing a provider. It could be anybody. It could be a parent, a provider, a teacher, principal, whatever, but they have to be trained in how to properly restrain a child in a way that will not hurt that child and to leave marks and bruises and all these different things that have been happening. Now, I will say that especially as children get older and there's you know, I've, I've physically seen it in working with, you know, many of you know, I, I got through most of my BCBA except <laughs> three classes. Um, and I remember, you know, a training that I had and we had to go and observe and we were doing our hours and that sort of thing. And um, we were trained in restraining a child. It's actually something that I physically could not do because I emotionally could not handle it. I just couldn't. Um, and so you have to, that's something you have to make sure of as well. Like I was quick to say, okay, no, I don't want to do that. You know, the, I, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, where people that do do it, you need to make sure that they're thoroughly trained and that they have hours of training of, of physically doing this with children. Yes. Mom, it's bedtime. Is it? It's yeah. only 9.04. Give me 10 more minutes and then I'll come out, okay? okay. All right. I hug. All right, come here. It's in the bed. Here. All right, come here. Come here, come here. Let me see your eye a second. Hold on, guys. All right. I love you. I'll be out in just a second, okay? All right. Um. So... Just be mindful of this. This is a parent decision. This is a, you know, it's like one of those things. <laughs> it's a tough subject to talk about, but it's it's stuff that you have to think about, you know. Um, and I don't want it to become, I will delete anything that becomes an argument on here in regards to this. Um, because it's a topic that has to be discussed. Um, it has to go into the IEP. Um or, or don't gripe about it. And if there's provisions in which you want the school system to follow, then you have to open your mouth and you have to put it in writing. And if you don't, then don't go griping about it later because they did what they did and you hadn't put it in writing and you hadn't gone to an IEP meeting and put it in writing into that IEP, okay? Because it should be. It's actually a mandated thing and for some reason, the school systems aren't saying anything and a lot of parents aren't saying anything. 
and then the parents are being called because the child's been restrained, then the parents flip out because the child's been restrained and they didn't approve of it, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, is they don't have to ask your permission. There's no paper that you sign that says, hey, you know, if your child flips out and is throwing desks and everything else, we're just going to sit back and do nothing. It doesn't work like that. So just like, you know, I'm a go-getter in regards to, you know, the IEP, I I'm going to advocate for all children and say, something's going to happen and you may not be happy about it. So before that happens, get to writing an email tonight and get to making that IEP meeting to put what you want done into that, into that IEP immediately. Okay. And remember, this is people that are trained who are doing restraints with a child in the school system. If somebody that's not trained in restraining a child is restraining your child, then there's a big problem there. That's the school system looking at lawsuits. Okay? So make sure that that goes into your IEP as well. That I, Miss Smith, allow my child to be restrained in this way. A, B, C, and D. Okay? If my child's doing this, this is what I approve you to do. I also want a phone call next once everything calms down. I want an email of a detailed summary of what happened from beginning to end. Well, good night. Good night, girly. And then you have a laid out plan of action, okay? And you know, and in that email and in your phone call, you need to know, you need to be told, and you put this in your IEP, that whoever restrained your child, you want their name and you want their qualifications in regards to their training in reference to restraints every time. Because then you can reference back and you can, um, when you reference back, you can, um, what is it? <laughs> when you reference back, you can then suggest that person. That's what I meant. So it always goes back to that person. They're not going to want to put that person in there. But you as the parent have every right to know who restrained your child. So you put that in the IEP. I got to get off here because I got to talk to all my students in reference to the course. Um, so we have a Zoom call coming on. So, um, and I'm late already, but some of them are on here. So I got to get off here. But um, so that's Monday's tip of the week. I know it was kind of a tough one, um, but I, I definitely had my notes up here along with the, <laughs> with the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education. So I made sure that, you know, I, I was covering all my bases here. All right. So, hey, Tara, Kylie, Carol, Grace, Jeff, Jesse, how are you? Um, Kristen, um, make sure you post a one below if you're new. Post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. And um, Thursday night is content night. Um, welcome, Tony. How are you? Hey, Cheryl, Hernandez, um, Jennifer, hi. Um, Jennifer, fam, how are you? Awesome, you're discussing this. Uh, very rough, <laughs> rough thing. I don't like discussing this. <clears throat> um, you had no idea schools could do that. Glad you told me. What are you talking about, Jesse? Um, Jennifer says, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Nicole. Um, what are you laughing at? You'll have to tell me. Um, Michelle says, first time here. I just saw you and my son has not been allowed. What do you guys mean allowed his IEP? I don't understand what you guys mean by that. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Are you talking about in your child's IEP? If you're talking about in your child's IEP, I don't recommend your child going into their IEP. I mean, shoot, I would never want Skylar in my, well, she's seen me flip shit, so it would be okay. But no, 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 no. I mean, unless your child is older and they need to be there for some reason. Now, I will bring Skylar in to test her, her goals to see if they re really are mastered. And I've told you guys about that. I make her feel awesome. I bring her in. I test the goal and it puts everybody on the spot. So awesome. And she thinks she's, you know, just coming in and everybody she knows is there and she's doing this awesome thing. But really, I'm testing what they said. Um, but I don't recommend bringing your child in an IEP. Now, you guys know your children better, but 
I flip shit in an IEP, so it just would not be a good idea um, at all. So you guys have to make that decision. Um, uh, Christine, I think, said at the state, uh, it depends on their age. In all honesty, you can bring your child into an IEP at any age. It's up to you. You're the parent. So um, there's no set age, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's no set age um, in any state. So you can bring your child into an IEP if you choose to. Um, I don't see why you'd want to bring them in to sit that long, but if that's what you want. Um, so Michelle says, um, he says one thing and the teachers say another, I believe half of each. Put one of those, get one of those recorders. I did that for a little while. Put it on her back, his backpack. You'll record the whole thing. Um, had several meetings the last two weeks. Hopefully it's going to be better. Good luck to you. Who are you, who are you talking to? Oh, to Jennifer. Oh, yeah. Um, I think they are saying their child is not allowed. Yeah, they're allowed my EP. Show show me where it says in your state that they can't go. That that's not true. There's no age limit. It's up to the parent. Completely up to the parent, because the fact is, per idea, the child is part of the team. Fact. Per idea, your child is part of the IEP team. It is up to you if they attend. All right. My son does not need to be restrained at school. He emotions are the hardest part. He is um, verbal and very functional. And my son prefers seclusion in the hallway for tests and graded work. So he is not comparing himself to others and being distracted. Yeah. See, that's, a, that's not a... Um, being secluded because he was bad or which is why the desk was put against the wall because the child was being, you know, disruptive or whatever. And, you know, the teacher secluded him on purpose. It's your situation here is he takes a test and he is taken out into the hallway, which is actually not seclusion. It's actually an accommodation. Um, his bad, tiring meltdowns all the time happen with me. I'm new here, y'all. She um, does she have a child with autism? Does who have a child with autism? <clears throat> I'm talking to Michelle Sneed. Does who have a child with autism? Well, you can ask all you want, Jennifer, but if you don't put it in writing or in the IEP. Keep asking. You'll be asking for a long time. They don't care. Um, Yesnia, thank you. I have my son's IEP in a month. You're welcome. Um, Brittany, hi. Um, hey, Cheryl. Um, oh, okay, Jesse. Um, Jennifer, all right. Hey, Angelita, how are you? Um, Jennifer's age 16. Now that we are in high school, our son has to sign a paper in order to not have to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. Once they're 16. Yeah. Because <clears throat> that whole transition thing happens at 16. It should start at 14 and then that transition happens at 16, which is federally mandated. And then there, there's different things between that 16 and 18 mark. Um, two questions. One, where are you located? Um, Northern Virginia, D.C. metropolitan area. Two, would you be willing to come to an organization and speak? I do it all the time. Yes, um, Leanne. Um, and answer some questions. Yes. And if it's too far or whatever, I can do it via Zoom or Skype. Um, Yasnia says, hi, I'm in California. I'm fighting for my son's school. Allowed to take him to Angeline's device um, diagnosed by the doctor. Okay. You're pretty worked up. <laughs> um no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, Cheryl. No, I don't like talking about restraints. It's like an uncomfortable subject for me. Like, I personally would just not be comfortable doing it. You know, like, um, when Skylar flips out, I, I just let her flip out unless she was hurting herself. And, but I've, I, I've been lucky to not have to go into that, you know, that bad. Like she was hurting herself physically for a period of time. Um, and, Thank God she has amazing BCBAs um, 
in her corner that change up her BIP all the time um, to create better strategies that that she really takes on and actually implements them herself. So I think that's great. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't have her mouth on. She had an awesome one this morning. It was great. Right when I woke up, and you guys know I'm not a morning person, right when I woke up, bam, awesome meltdown this morning. I, I had a great day. I don't know if many of you noticed, but I was off my phone. I was really off the computer. It, my day started out like crap. All right, so I got to go, guys. I have a Zoom face-to-face -face chat that I have with all my course students, so I got to go. But um, go ahead and post all your questions, and I will get to them. Um, and remember, for some of you newbies, when you post questions, try to put a little bit more detail so I know who you're talking to and the question you're asking, because I really like to answer them. But if I don't know what really you're saying and you're not on here to re-repeat it, then I, I don't. I can't really answer. So um, just kind of make sure you clarify a little bit. All right. But I'm going to get off here. I don't want to talk about this subject anymore. I don't like talking about restraints. But, you know, someone had asked me and said, you know, I'm really dealing with this right now. Can you please, you know, tell me, you know, what the COPA says? Because COPA is updated every month where if you go to parent sites or, you know, different ones that I've argued with them for a long time, their stuff is not updated. Like if you look at some of their articles, it says 2014 or 2011 or <laughs> ideas updated and amended since then. I mean, they got to get with the times. Yeah, we're getting off here and getting on to Zoom. Yes, Cheryl. All right, guys. So I will talk to you soon. Um, if you have any questions in regards to this, because I know I'm kind of hopping off quick because I have to go do this Zoom with my, my class. So Ask the questions, post them below. If you're new, post a one below. If you're an oldie but goodie, post a two below. Everybody that's on here with um, the course, I'm going to get my other computer and we're going to get started. Log in with your link. I'll talk to you guys soon and I will be on here on Thursday with the content. I will be on tomorrow on the group, over on the group, um, for, of course, your live q and I know you guys.